Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Kill Your Gods podcast. It's a podcast about killing gods and deicide. Had to turn my levels up there. Uh, so, we called an audible this week. I'm sorry if you were expecting uh, the first episode of Crying of Lot 49 with Seamus Millar. I actually just recorded that episode on schedule. However, that will be up next week. As you guys may have noticed, I've been adding a bit of extra content that I was not anticipating. Um, after the events of uh, the Capitol Hill siege on January 6th, I believe was it was, on January 6th, with, uh, I was personally pretty disgusted by the whole thing. Not only, I don't, I don't want to make this a left or right thing, even though it is, but... Uh, yeah, that, that was just a sad day for America, and it's the kind of thing that just goes to show when you humor idiots for too long, or, you know, co-opt a fringe conspiracy theory to be your foot soldiers, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, President Trump piece of shit. Um, for a time now, I have been aware of the subreddit QAnon Casualties, in addition to QAnon Recovery, or I think it might just be Recovery with a Q. Uh, these are Reddit communities where QAnon casualties are people who have lost loved ones, friends, family members to the QAnon conspiracy. And uh, uh, let's be honest, just mental illness in general. Uh, there are certain psychological aspects that make people more susceptible to things like these as a way to assuage their fears about the world. So QAnon casualties was one of those I was aware of. That, as you can imagine, peaked with a lot of the Capitol Hill riots. Uh, recovery, or QAnon Recovery, is the other one for people who are coming out of that. Um, I've been fascinated in doing research on this for some time, so I reached out to the moderators of QAnon Casualties. If anybody would come on and talk about it, they told me to get Mike Rains. You can find him on Twitter, at Poker Politics. Name Poker and Politics, at Poker Politics. And, uh, yeah, he came on and we talked about QAnon and what you should maybe do if you have a loved one who is, uh, you know, trapped in there. I, I was really astonished just how much a lot of it sounds like regular addiction. Obviously, I know a thing or two about addiction. A lot of my family is in recovery. If you've been listening since uh, this podcast was called I Hate Infinite Jest, that book that deals quite a bit with um, addiction and recovery and this seems to really be no different uh i won't i won't hide it like a newscaster like are you terrified of losing your loved ones tune in at seven i'll tell you right now that the basics is uh you know try to be open to them try not to be combative with them just you know i i, I make a joke in this and there's a few jokes in this i try to give mike a heads up that like Hey, I take this seriously, but, you know, I am a comedian. This is a comedy podcast, so I will be making some jokes. Please know I will try to keep them in good taste, and I have no intention on insulting anybody involved in it. Uh, you know, it's just what the podcast is. But um, I did make the joke that, like, if somebody is talking to you about QAnon, like, chances are their lives aren't great aside from that. So maybe hear them out and what they have to say. Like, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty crazy, eating babies. Uh, how's life at home? How's, how's work? You're doing all right, you know, because more likely than not, a lot of column B bleeds over into column A a little bit there. So we talk about a few things. We talk about the origin of QAnon, uh, affiliated theories, old theories, the history of conspiracy in general. It's tied a lot to blood libel, which, of course, was used against the Jews, which since I am actively trying to build half Jews with my fiance, uh, well, not yet, sometime soon. But uh, I have some vested interest in, you know, the Jews not being portrayed as vicious bloodsuckers. Yeah, I, I, I have an interest in making sure that kind of thing gets knocked down a little bit. So we talk about that. We talk about how people get into QAnon, the psychological uh, needs that it fulfills in people. Um, we get into some of the worst stories unfortunately we get into we, we have some fun we talk about uh conspiracy theories we still maybe give some credence um you know th this stuff in there guys this is uh it's it, it's sad it's a sad one it's also important particularly with the inauguration coming up uh things are kind of at a fever 
hitch. I feel something in the air in the zeitgeist that maybe it's dying down a little bit. I hope I'm I hope I'm right. I don't know. But uh it's important we have those discussions and if I can make it a little bit entertaining for an hour and a half and you know, you learn something that might help you in your day to day life. I know it's so tempting to tell these people they're just being fucking idiots and cutting them off, but I isolation is how they got here in the first place. So Mike Rains, QAnon, check out QAnon Casualties, uh, check out Recovery with a Q. If you put it out there, it'll it'll pop up. Just uh, don't... I think a lesson we need to learn, and that's left and right, is uh, don't demonize people, don't throw people away. There's still use for everyone. And uh, <laughs> so, like I said, this is a comedy podcast. Which is why I might have wrote, written a QAnon song. Um, so yeah, just know I take all things seriously, but comedy is how I deal with tragedy. I mean, when we pulled the plug on my stepfather and I watched the man die before my very eyes, I wrote a whole stand-up routine around it because it's just the only way I can deal with shit. So please enjoy. I, I don't have a title for this. It's just called The QAnon Song. Uh, don't hate me. If they take this up as an anthem, I will try to not sell out and make money off of them for this. It won't be this recording. This recording's garbage. All right. Enjoy. We'll be back next week with Seamus Millar and starting with the crying of lot 49. Power as it courses through my veins All the evil and the magic it contains The tears of children as I slice them to the bone All for the eternal juice, the sweet adrenochrome Socialized healthcare can't hide your guns I'm gonna seize ya, my den of torture in the basement, a comic ping pong pizza Destroying gender Until Americans all look like Tilda Swinton I hate your freedom, I am the devil My name is Hillary Clinton What you gonna do? Nothing When I come for you, Mr. American Oh no Who's that riding in on the storm? It's, it's, it's Q! God, I'm so triggered right now. Gonna save the children with my Q-dumps. Any day we're gonna arrest Forrest Gump. And my messiah is Donald J. Trump. He loves porn stars only to disguise. Gonna save the children from early demise. The billionaire casino man is gonna save my blue collar soul. Are you gonna join the army of lonely uncles? Gonna eat babies, cause those are the only two sides Marching to victory Are you too blind to see? It's not that we disagree It's that I'm too scared to live And be to blame my failures on somebody else is gonna come true any day now i feel it okay welcome to the kill your gods podcast special edition special topical news edition my guest this week from the QAnon casualties subreddit mike rains how are you doing mike i am well sir yeah so um after all the chaos that went down to the capitol last week and has been going through our country for a long time i kind of wanted to jump on top of the story see if we could talk a little bit about QAnon. and i had been fascinated with QAnon casualties ever since i found it on reddit i messaged the mods they said hey i said hey would any of you like to come talk to me on my podcast they said talk to poker and politics and here we are so mike before we get started let us know uh what you're working on where we can find you on the internet uh, you can find me at Poker Politics on Twitter, as you just said, and uh, I have my own podcast, the Adventures in Hell World podcast. Uh, that's Hell World with a Q instead of an O. You can find that. Uh, 
you can find the link on my Twitter feed and also it's on sound it's on Spotify, SoundCloud and iTunes and all that good stuff. <clears throat> okay. So Mike, what was your uh, how did you even get into the QAnon thing in the for obviously not into it into it, but like enough that it seems to be taking up, you know, you're devoting some time to uh, discussing it. What what was your introduction to it? Uh, my introduction to QAnon is kind of like, uh, in a way, like a life journey, because in high school, I was obsessed with the assassination of John F. Kennedy. This led me down the road of becoming a 9-11 truther for a while. And then uh, one day I was talking to a friend and that friend was just like, no, like 9-11 trutherism is dumb. You're an idiot. And that like <laughs> kind of woke something up in me because it always kind of just felt like everyone felt the way I did. And then when I started looking into it to try to like show him that he was wrong and I was right, I disproved myself. And then from there, I always started studying like this kind of conspiracy theories and like why people get into them, what's so interesting about them to people. And I started following the Illuminati, New World Order, conspiracy theory along from like a lot many years. And then when I heard about QAnon, I knew it was Illuminati and New World Order. It was the idea of a shadowy group of people behind the scenes ruling the world. I knew that's what the story was, but I saw it was getting more and more popular. And I was like, why is this so popular? What's making this jump to the mainstream the way the, this other stuff didn't? And the answer is that these people really think there's a solution, that, that Donald Trump's going to take care of all their problems and defeat the bad guys. Because before, when you would believe in the Illuminati New World Order stuff, your only hope was that God was going to step in and save the day because everyone was corrupt. Everyone was a bad guy to flip the script on that. And to have the president be a good guy who's going to ride in on the white horse and save the day. That really changed the dynamic of the theory and it made it much more palatable and popular for people. Cause it wasn't like before where it was like, you find out the world sucks and there's nothing you can do about it and everything's bad. Now it's, you find out the world sucks, but we're going to fix it. And we're going to fix it really soon. Right. It does kind of weaponize it to a certain degree that I hadn't considered. Because, like, if you were into, uh, you know, uh, JFK assassination theories or 9-11, like, well, yeah, but what do you really do with that information? It's not like, you know, the president of the United States is co-opting it and putting it to work for him, which obviously is the case in this scenario. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like the problem with like the, those other ideas is that you're never going to get anywhere. And on some level, you kind of know it. Like you could have all the evidence in the world that Oswald didn't act alone. You could have all the evidence in the world that the planes didn't knock down the towers, but it's not going to change things materially in the world. Whereas with QAnon, there is going to be a change. Like you are going to save the world any day now. Like. Mm -hmm. All you're talking to your friends and getting them into the QAnon and red pilling them, as it's called in the community, it's going to lead to the Great Awakening where everyone's accepting that Hillary Clinton and Obama and James Comey and all our other enemies are Satanists who deserve to be executed and that Trump is right to execute them. Yeah, there's like there's a sales aspect and an evangelism that uh, there's not quite as much. I mean, I, I feel like it, it definitely jumped a little bit because it, again you think back to the jfk thing what does a person really have to gain out of that and not like we'll get into the psychology but in the jfk aspect like all you would really have the, the only real plus i can think for you is like you kind of get to feel more intelligent you know there's not really much you can do with that in your day-to-day -day life other than like oh I'm, I'm much smarter than those sheeple but now it's like uh you know, it, it's funny that so much of them are anti-political correctness and uh, they mock a lot of that group with social justice warriors and white knights mocking them as like, oh, you guys see yourselves as like these brave gods coming in to defend people's honor when that is literally what they believe they are doing themselves. Yeah, that's one of the biggest parts of QAnon is the evangelism. It is that kind of stuff. Because again, as you said, like all you can do with the JFK stuff is annoy your friends at parties and maybe get one or two of them to see the light the way you see it. It's not a real part of like the research or the reading of the books and stuff like that is to go out and annoy people. Whereas with QAnon, it's part of the, th it's part of the movement that you have to get more people into the movement in order to help save the world because we have to get this information out to as many people as possible 
so that it becomes acceptable in society to see Tom Hanks get arrested. And that's why you see all these things happening where uh, families are being torn apart because the parents can't stop trying to red pill the children, the husband can't stop trying to red pill the spouse. I've had so many people ask me, why can't these families just move along with one person believing and one person not believing? And one of the main reasons for that is because conversion is a huge part of the movement. You have to get them in. And if you're not getting them in, like it's a, it's kind of a failing on your part, but it's also that like that they are complicit in what's happening. One of the things that you see so much is that these people get frustrated with their family members and their friends. And they're just like, why won't they believe? Why won't they see the truth? And that frustration then leads to a further entrenchment in QAnon and in the movement because one of the tactics they use that I've read about is called love bombing, where they will shower you with support and adulation for the hard work you're trying to do or for the hardships you're suffering. Like I remember welcome, this one guy, welcome, welcome to the fold, brother. Like you're here, you're on the right side now. Yeah, oh yeah. Like one of the most awful things that made me so sad to see it was this one guy was like. Well, it finally happened. My wife took the kids and they went up to grandma's and I was just trying to tell them the truth about the world and all this stuff. And they just, they just wouldn't have it. And this guy got like a couple thousand likes and hundreds and hundreds of tweets telling him to buck up and we support you. And one day your family's going to come back to you and see that you were telling the truth and that you were right and to not give up. And it's just like that kind of support network makes it so hard to get out of a movement like this when like you tell people you're destroying your life and they're telling you you're doing a good thing. You're doing the right thing and that it'll turn around and it will be, it'll work itself out. It's, you know, it's that, terrifying. That, see, that's another way to look back again on uh, the conspiracy theories of old is that they were so much more isolating. Like I feel like a lot of people who got into, you know, hardcore conspiracy theory back in the day, all it would take was like meeting somebody in person and just like, I, cause I mean, I might be uh this is definitely a bit of a stereotype, but I mean, people who are deep into conspiracy theory, they tend not to be living like awesome lives you want to jump in on. They're usually very, you know, alone, isolated. But now that it's been kind of digitized, you know, digitized and crusaderized, like it's it's very, everybody has that backup behind them now. Oh yeah, you see these guys like uh, Jordan Sather, Praying Medic, um, in the matrix you have all these guys who have streaming shows who have youtube channels when they're not being pulled down by youtube and they kind of make it like appealing and fun and exciting and that you're part of this like really like nice community of good people doing the right thing and you're not dealing with the uh, the gif of the guy from always sunny in philadelphia with the cork board and the red strings and the frantic look in his eyes trying to map it all out mm -hmm. instead you're dealing with these guys who are like slick they're well produced they have an act like um you know this actually this this actually plays into something i was curious about is that honestly when i was first looking into uh, a lot of the q stuff especially the fact that it was coming up on 4chan part of me wondered if like whoever this q was wasn't actually a believer himself but was somebody just fucking around and getting people all riled up I mean, the, the original Q and what their plan was, like, we'll never know, most likely. And the thing is, is that uh, like one of the areas that I, I, I work the most on is like reading the early drops and understanding them. There's this uh, great Twitter, uh, QAnon Origins a move, research movement or whatever. But um, that you just see how this guy is like reading the audience. He's reading the crowd mm -hmm. and he's trying to get reactions like uh, there's these early Q drops where he talks about how there's not that much crime in uh, the world and how there's more good people than bad. And then over the course of time, he pivots to, oh no, they're all corrupt. They're all terrible. They're all bad and evil. And it's just, it's like so obvious that he's just like looking for something that will get reactions, looking for something that will get like more people posting about him on 4chan. And, and you know what, in that theory, I always have to wonder what the hell did Tom Hanks do to anybody? Oh, Tom uh, Hanks, he is a he is a national treasure for God's sake. How did they how did they convince a subsect to hate Forrest Gump? You know, 
Uh, that's a, that's kind of a cue. It's not so much cue, but it's what happens with QAnon is that like if you're a big if you're a big part of the movement, you can just move the movement yourself. You don't need Q's blessing for this. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a woman named uh, Sarah uh, Sarah Ruth Ashcroft or Ashcraft, and she is a QAnon promoter who uh, I I feel terrible whenever I like interact with her or post her tweets on my on my timeline and stuff like that because she is someone who absolutely needs help. She obviously is struggling with some mental illness that mm -hmm. needs to be dealt with. And she claimed that her father sold her to Tom Hanks as, oh. uh, as, as a sex slave and that Hanks abused and assaulted her. And so that, that was the one half of it. The other half is that Hanks... One of the things he does is he posts on his social media these uh, discarded pieces of clothing and other debris on the sides of the road and on beaches. Because when you're as famous as Tom Hanks, you really don't have any activities you can do out in the world where people can see you or else they'll be like, oh my God, it's Tom Hanks and, you're, and your mm -hmm. life is ruined. So this guy like wanders, walks the highways and stuff like that. And he'll take a photo of a discarded glove or a discarded sandal and he'll like kind of make up a story about it. And people think that's like the trophies of the people he's brutally murdered and oh, stuff God. like that. So they have concocted this this theory out of whole cloth. And, and, and again, Tom Hanks, great actor. I could not imagine he would pummel somebody to death or even be capable of it. Right. And it's just it's, it's just so silly. But between Sarah's claims against him and his uh, his Instagram posts, they've constructed this narrative of him just literally being a monster and so you have this, and again, this is one of those things where QAnon will often uh, have something crazy happen and they'll say, oh, but Q never said that. Q never talked about that. And that's not an excuse because the movement doesn't really care what Q says about a lot of things. Like the whole Tom Hanks is a pedophile. That's not Q based at all, but QAnon swears by it. Um, one of their more ugly, horrible things QAnon loves talking about is Michelle Obama being transgender, oh, being a man. They love calling her Big Mike and showing all these different photos. Of I, I've seen that one Photoshop of like, oh, Barack with his college friend Mike. And it's like the poorest Photoshop you've ever seen. Ugh. Oh, yeah. They do so much stuff like this. And you, uh, if you look through uh, all the Q posts and there's different like archiving sites where you can like word search, uh, Michelle Obama is literally never mentioned. The only time she's ever, Michelle ever comes up is under her maiden name, Michelle Robinson. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So like Q's never said anything about this. But if you were able to like trick your way into QAnon, and got a follower and got followers and had like five, 6,000 people on Twitter. And you did a poll, like, is Michelle Obama a man? It would be like 95% or more. Yes. Like just absolutely. This is a mm. truth. This is a core belief of these people. See, I, uh, God, you know, if I kind of wish we could start our own conspiracy theory, because like the way they jump on Michelle Obama, like what, because she's just like, a slightly, I, I don't even want to say a slightly larger woman. She's just like not a waif. Meanwhile, like Donald Trump, their, you know, God, King and savior has married like three successive Transylvanian women, like vampire. It's right there, but they don't want to get anywhere near it. Um, so let, let's talk about some of the origin of the Q thing. Uh, a lot of people say this grew out of the Pizzagate thing, which was the theory that John Podesta and Hillary Clinton were uh, running a pedophile ring out of the Comet Ping Pong Pizzeria in D.C., which, again, there's uh, the, the fact that it's like such a, it's not just like, oh, these people are bad, they're writing bad laws. It's like, no, they are fucking and eating children, like comically evil. Oh, yeah, this is one of the biggest parts of this conspiracy theory is that our enemies are not just like bad people. They're right. literal thralls of Satan. They're the worst of the worst. They're absolutely subhuman monsters. And Pizzagate, in a way, it was the uh, proto QAnon, and now it's a pathway back into QAnon mm. because you'll find these QAnon promoters who will say things like, well, Pizzagate was never debunked, or like we never got to the bottom of Pizzagate. And the thing is, is that uh, if you follow the people that promoted this nonsense, 
they are like pathological liars and mm -hmm. they are so disingenuous about what they say. Um, the video Out of Shadows, which was the biggest attempt to bring Pizzagate back to the fore and to suck people into QAnon with it. Uh, Liz Crokin is in that uh, video and, and she's one, she was one of the biggest Pizzagate promoters out there. And she would constantly be talking about how pizza is code for pedophilia and everyone knows this and this is a true thing. But what she will do after she says this, the B-roll footage that will go on on the screen over her voiceover shows the words cheese pizza, cheese pizza, always cheese pizza. And that's because it was a 4chan code back in the day for child porn because it's both they have the initial CP. So cheese pizza, child porn. That was the connection. If you go uh, to WikiLeaks and you go to the Podesta emails, much like I said about Michelle Obama, you can name search her on the Q ar archives. If you word search cheese pizza and the Podesta emails, no hits come up. It is wait, never. So wait, released. that part of it's made up too? I, uh, okay. I honestly thought they had taken some like innocent reference to cheese pizza in like Hillary Clinton's personal like email, like writing to whoever, like it, it but not even that part of it is true. It's not in there. The only thing that's in there is pizza. So they have to lie and expand pizza to cheese pizza and then make it the code. And See, it's not, I, you because know, I, again, I, the I, cheese no. pizza is based off the initials. Right. It's, you know, I, I've actually, I remember I had some uh, friends who were kind of like, ugh, unfortunately, I have had friends who were, they were always big on the like, well, I'm just asking questions. What's the problem with that? Which, I mean, it, it's horseshit because, you know, it, it is pretty a big deal overall. But like one of them, I had to point out, like, dude, you and I have worked at several pizzerias together. You know what a pizzeria basement like they imagine there's like a fucking Resident Evil movie hive city under a goddamn pizza. Like, what do they think is hap? I don't know. Just the sheer mechanics of it. And this is where it gets into, like, uh, you mentioned the woman said that she was uh, delusional, sold into sexual slavery with Tom Hanks. Is like, it's not even really clear which one of them's are just crazy, which I'm not using as a pejorative. I mean, as in their mental processes, process, uh, faculties are not processing information. And how many people are just fucking around? And how many people are just, like, dickheads? I, ugh. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's one of the kind of big questions whenever I look at these people is, are they deluded or are they just grifting? Or, like, what is their angle? What are they working at here? And you can tell, like, in situations like, like Out of Shadows, where Liz Crokin and all the other people in this, in this video, she's a big QAnon believer. They never bring up QAnon. They're just working this one angle because they know what they're doing. They don't want the taint of QAnon on them. So they're going to act like Pizzagate's a real thing that requires real research and to look into it because they know anyone who's dumb enough to believe them could fall down the QAnon rabbit hole and get sucked in. Mm. And so you just kind of like, for me, it's like I watch these people and I'm just seeing how devious they are and if they have any honesty about them. Are they, tr are, are they a true believer are they that much into it that they can't see right from wrong? Or are they just looking for new suckers? Are they looking to grow an audience mm -hmm. to expand a brand and to start selling stuff to people? And I got to admit, that's one of the tricky things about it is just like, this is clearly a group that you can co-opt. I mean, the, the president of the goddamn United States has co-opted them. And I'm sure like whoever is making those rinky dink shitty Q merch in their basement is cleaning up right now. Oh, uh, the co-opting is so uh, aggressive. If you have any public, uh, any public ability, I mean, Lynn Wood and Sidney Powell, they just jumped into QAnon feet first, hadn't been around for the last three years of this movement, and they became heroes overnight. Because mm. if you just say what these people wanted you to say, and you tell them what they want to hear, you're in. You're you're the best. Lynn Wood put like the hashtag where we go one, we go all WWG one WGA mm -hmm. in his, in his Twitter bio, he was talking about the great awakening and he was saying all these things and they immediately started loving him. And Sydney Powell, when she was talking about the Kraken, uh, you mentioned resident evil, like they were Photoshopping Sidney Powell's head on Alice's body from the resident evil movies. Ugh. And she was like dual wielding God. guns, getting ready to blow away the deep state. And, 
So like you, like if you're a public facing person, be it a politician or a lawyer working for Trump or whatever, if you just want like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of loyal fans that will do anything for you, just start mouthing QAnon platitudes and boom, they are yours. They're in the palm of your hand. What was really funny was uh, Joe M, uh, one of the biggest promoters from back in the day, he was actually, because he got kicked off Twitter, he was on, I think it was Parlor back before it got shut down, mm. and he was whining about how big an audience Lynn Wood was getting. And you could just see the jealousy <laughs> from the old-time grifter watching the new hotshot come in and steal his crowd. Man, even, even when you're fighting against the evil Kaaba of baby eaters, man, somebody's just got to steal your thunder. It's such bullshit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Here's uh, Joe just honestly red peeling people, and here comes Lynn Wood swooping in to steal all those people. And I mean, uh, Sydney Powell was very kind of obvious with the grift because she was Michael Flynn's lawyer, and she and Flynn running this Michael Flynn defense fund. They're just taking money from these people hand over fist. So I've listened to a few. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts is uh, War Room with James Carville and Al Hunt, and they both like know michael flynn personally and they've stated a few times like we don't know what the fuck he's doing like i is this the only thing he is this a grift does he believe this it's uh, it's hard again it's hard to tell you don't know what up or down is yeah well the thing i'll say about michael flynn is that he was handed this pile of money by the person writing the Q stuff because they just jumped oh. on the whole thing that like that Flynn was persecuted illegitimately, that it was bad what happened to him, that it was so unfair. So pretty much at the start of QAnon, in the pecking order of like the great saints of QAnon, there was Trump and then there was Michael Flynn and then there was Jeff Sessions. Mm -hmm. And they have had to try to reason out why Trump hates Jeff Sessions so much now. And they try to excuse and justify that. Yeah, they kind of had to retcon that part of it. Yep, absolutely. But Flynn and Trump are like the best. Like there was when this whole thing uh, started happening and um, they started making up all this nonsense about how Michael Pence could uh, invalidate the election of the Electoral mm -hmm. College on the 6th and then the riot broke out instead and how Pence could like either throw the electors back to the states or invalidate them himself when it was looking like Pence wasn't going to do what they wanted, like a bunch of QAnon were like, uh, get rid of Pence and replace him with Michael Flynn as the vice president. Get Flynn in there. He'll take care of business. And then when uh, the riot happened and then Trump gave that weird non-concession speech where he talked about the peaceful transition to a new administration, but he wouldn't mention Biden by name. QAnon was like, it'll be a new administration, the Trump Flynn administration. Oh yeah, that's just uh, just looking for everything. There is like a Nostradamus aspect of this, and I think that's actually kind of the fun, just because you get to reinterpret and like piece together the clues and put together the prophecy. Like, I wonder. Like, I have to imagine there's not a lot of people. Like, if we're talking the overlap between uh, like a religious kind of mindset and a conspiracy kind of mindset, like there's got to be like a lot of overlap there because they believe such like magical far-flung nonsense for the most part oh th that is very true um like i remember i listened to a flat earth guy on a podcast and like blew my mind where he wrapped up the podcast with and the reason they hide this all from us is because they know if we know the earth is flat we'll know that god's real like wait what what i did not see that part coming Oh yeah, biblical flat earth is a big thing because like there's like all this talk about the earth being set on pillars and stuff like that. So biblical flat earth is a big part of the flat earth movement. And that that kind of religiosity, it is really a big part of QAnon and what you said about the reinterpreting the prophecies. So many things that Q has said have not come to pass. And then they keep trying to find a way to fix it and to fit it in. Like, uh, there was this, um, Q said this one thing where he said, like, C before D with, like, the C in brackets and the D in brackets. And they kept coming up with all these different ways to interpret it. Like, but originally it was like, Comey will be arrested, then we will declassify, or it'll be this and then that. And then uh, recently with the election getting certified, they became, like, certification, then declass. So they, they're always trying to find a way to make the prophecy fit. 
Uh, one day Q had an offhanded comment about 10 days of darkness. So whenever mm -hmm. anything weird happens, QAnon's always like, this might be the 10 days. This yeah. might be the moment. So they're, they're always trying to find a way to make it work. They're always trying a way to make what Q said come true. See, the last year or so, I've actually gotten big on uh, going to 4chan on the poll board, which uh, whenever my fiance asks why I do that and subject myself to that, it's like, I, I want to see what the animals are saying, the other side. And uh, every single day, no matter what happens, if it's rain, if it's rainy, if it's snowy, if Trump, you know, fucking trips a little bit, the headline is always, it's happening, it's going down. And, uh, you know, 4chan is actually where it started, if we want to talk about uh, that. It was in 2017, right, where they first started, the Q drop started happening? Yes, yeah, so October uh, 2017 was when the first Q drop started happening. Uh, they said that Hillary was about to be arrested. Her passport was being flagged. Then she was detained, but not arrested. And that was on October 28th. And then it just kept going. And the thing is, is if you read the early Q drops, he sets himself an incredibly tight deadline because he started posting on the 28th. And then he says that by November 3rd, you're, the world's going to end. That like mm -hmm. on November 3rd, 2017, there's going to be mass arrests. Uh, the, net, the emergency broadcast system is going to be used. There's going to be this huge fight. And the reason why he says all these things is because back then on the, cha on the chance, there was all this talk about a massive insurrection happening on uh, the 4th with Antifa rising up and starting a civil war and they were all buying into it. So this was like a counter narrative to the Antifa civil war was that like Q and the national guard are going to crush the bad guys and stop them either on the third or the fourth. And so you had these like two fictional narratives fighting each other, but as Q just kept getting more momentum and more spit and more uh, steam, eventually the guy or guys that were running it, like came up with an excuse for like why nothing happened on November 3rd and then they just kept going and they've never really had a plan ever since then they've just been running along uh just spitting plates for three years ever since then mm. but um the this whole thing was supposed to be over with in like five days this was supposed to be a very quick thing <laughs> because there had been a lot of guys pulling this same act before there was FBI Anon there was Mega Anon there was this uh, really hilarious guy called Highway Patrol Anon uh, who was like obsessed with adrenochrome and making up all these ridiculous statements. I remember like uh, someone sent me the, the post of him talking about a raid they did where they like captured like a hundred billion dollars in adrenochrome from like this raid. Yeah. And like, so this kind of thing was just really common on the chance and I've like heard people say stuff like when people talk about how this had to be a Russian psyop or that Steve Bannon was behind it or stuff like that. And it's like, no, this is really just the dumb stuff that people did on the yeah. chance. Stu stupidity is self-perpetuating. It really yeah. doesn't need government assistance. No. And like, I remember someone saying like, oh, this is just a natural thing that happened on 4chan. And uh, Frederick Brennan, the guy who created 8chan was like, well, yes, this really is. This really mm -hmm. is an organic thing that happens on the chans. It's like a mushroom growing in the dark. Yeah. Like, this is just what I happens mean, on the chans. Yeah. You see how that happens, even with like, you know, Pepe the Frog. That was a thing that came out of nowhere. Why wouldn't this just be another rolling ball of mold that just happened to go down the path that it started gaining as it was rolling? And uh so you mentioned adrenochrome there. So I have uh, here in my notes, I put together a list of affiliated theories and uh, adrenochrome ties right into blood libel. For those of you unaware, uh, blood libel is the ancient thing of Jews accused of murdering Christian children to use their blood in matzah bread. The child was chosen in advance by a cabal of rabbis with their king Jew, drawing straws to determine whose province would have to provide the sacrifice. Uh, this was said to be done partially in mimicking of Christ's wounds, being in the hand or a lance in the side, and they had to do this ritual to overpower Christ's light. So right here, again, one of the OG conspiracy theories, we have number one, like magical thinking, like communication rates impossible in this era of history, two, an ethnic group acknowledging their own evil nature and only finding power and liberation in defiance of good. And three, this must be done through the through an innocent, which 
I just think is hilarious that, all, again, such a big uh, Christian background in a lot of these people, their whole thing is like, they're drinking blood. They're drinking adrenochrome. Meanwhile, like their actual mainstream religion they are a part of very much features the symbolic drinking of blood. Like, what's it? we drink blood in the right way, not like those people. Oh, yeah, uh, the blood libel. And this, uh, this all comes from the fact that, like, this kind of hatred of uh, this, this, this anti-Semitism is a big part of QAnon because this conspiracy is just the logical extension of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Yep. The anti-Semitic tract from the early 1900s that uh, then beloved Henry Ford took to America and printed out on his printing press. Yeah, for and, those of you not in the know, uh, the Elders of Zion is purported to be like the minutes taken from a meeting of evil global Jews and their plan to take over the world. And one of the things they leave out is that it is actually plagiarized from an earlier thing, only it was supposed to be about Napoleon. So again, just made up bullshit. That, again, that's another kind of facet as it goes through. It's not just that the other side is evil or bad or wrong. They know they're evil. They know they're in league with the devil it, it just can't be disagreement in any way it has to be the ultimate demonization again down to the part of fucking and eating children yeah the uh the, the protocols start this anti because the other thing is is that the plan to take over the world in the early 1900s was was control of the banks and control of the newspapers which was the media so you just extrapolate that to nowadays and because newspapers are just a sliver of the media now the jews control the banks the newspapers and entertainment music movies all this stuff they control it all and that's the shadowy group of people behind the scenes who secretly rule the world Ooh, so and whatever words they use to describe those people be it communists globalists uh, Luciferians, Satanists, it's all just code words for Jews because they know they can't say Jews or else they sound really anti-Semitic. So they have to come up with like stand-ins for the tiny religious minority that is secretly in charge of everything mm. to make it sound more plausible or at so least tolerable. I, I read some things that this is actually like a strange uh inherent aspect of european psychology like they don't really have this as much in the east or the middle east or africa but there is a consistent thing across european cultures of a basic idea that shadowy conspiratorial groups gather together in secret at night to plot to overthrow society and as part of their plotting the conspirators supposedly ritually abuse murder and consume children again like you said communists satanists witches Jews. Um, and the other aspect of it I saw in my research is that the times when these things become violent is when the power structure co-ops these theories, which obviously right now, um, it, Nazis, clearly the big one, but even the prog pogroms in Russia, where if we need a scapegoat, and again, just the complete lack of intelligence that comes with it. I was raised in, uh, there were parts of my family and my hometown that were quite a bit racist. And it all seems so absurd now as an adult. Like, yeah, all the problems, it's that small group of people who don't really have any power that we don't let do anything. But we're only bad to them because they, they earn it. Like, they're that bad. We need to treat them that bad. And just no logic ever pours itself into this situation. And it cracks me up with the QAnon people because they see themselves as, like, these big, tough, badass soldiers for the Lord. Like, guys, you're afraid of everything. What part of that sounds awesome to you? Oh, yeah, they, they hate everything about our society. Uh, I mean, anyone you see on television is part of the cabal. Anyone you uh, see in politics who's not completely subservient to Trump is part of the cabal. Mm -hmm. The entire world is just crawling with evil people and monsters. And only you and the few people you have on the Internet supporting you and Trump are on your side. So it creates this incredibly bleak us versus them worldview. And it's it's really depressing. I mean, it's one of the reasons why the Illuminati New World Order stuff really didn't cross over into the mainstream is because of that depressing nature of it, because it's very isolating, because it's very much uh, pull you out of society, pull you away from your family, and then give you nothing in return. Because you had said earlier about like how 
if you like figure out that Oswald didn't act alone, you have like smugness, you have intelligence, you feel mm. better about yourself. But that's really all you get. And I mean, there's only so much uh, like cachet that smugness can give you. Mm. Whereas uh, with this kind of thing, not only are you smug because you know the hidden truth, you also have the righteousness that you're on God's side mm-hmm. and your enemies are on Satan's side and they know it. They know they're wrong. They know they're bad. They know they're monsters. And then you also have the fact that like, you're going to get your uh, vengeance. You're going to be mm-hmm. redeemed. You're going to be shown as being right. And everyone else is going to be shown as being wrong. And you so, have and you have this new team behind you, which is the thing that really makes it jump from conspiracy to also cult. Yes, exactly. Uh, you have a movement behind you. You have people that will back you up. When you uh, get into an argument with someone online, you can go to these other people and they will immediately support you and tell you that you own that lib and you did a great job and you need to just keep the, up fighting the good fight soldier and we're going to win this thing. Mm-hmm. And that is really, uh, it's really powerful to have a sense of community. I was uh, talking to a QAnon supporter a couple nights ago and he was telling me that, well, Trump's going to win re-election. He's going to be sworn in on the 20th and blah, blah, blah. And I, and I just said to him, I was like, well, how much money do you want to bet on this? And he's like, well, I'm 17. <laughs> I don't, I'm 17. I don't have a job yet. I'll bet my account against you. And then I was like, oh, my God, you're 17. I remember what I was like when I was 17. And I, I had a talk with him. And he was just like, you know, you're, he was like, you're, you're, you're wrong about a lot of things, but at least you're not a bad person. There you and go. it was like, we actually got to that moment of detente between me and him where he acknowledged that I wasn't like a blood drinking Satanist and I was just another person on Twitter who just happened to think that QAnon was dumb. And that was kind of cool for a moment to be able to get him at least that far across the line mm-hmm. where he could acknowledge that. And I've so- had that happen with a couple of them and I've, and I've told all of them, I'm like, look guys, if you guys ever won, I'm still going to hang for treason, and you're probably still going to call me a pedophile, but thanks for giving me a character reference before I swing. I mean, <laughs> Make sure I get the nice rope, you know, so one that doesn't yeah. chafe too badly. Right. I, I, want, I want a tight knot. I don't want to strangle. I want the quick drop. So yeah. part, of, part of my uh, fascination with this, so the whole aspect of this show uh, this originally started as a book podcast over a controversial book called Infinite Jest. And the whole thing I always took was like, you know, uh, j- just have a little, take everything with like a, a grain of salt, which like just question, even things you love question it. And a lot of my background with that is, again, like I said, it grew up in kind of a racist hometown. Um, I was actually pretty into like the alt-right when it really started out now i mentioned that because you mentioned 17 what happened to me at 17 was i read some ayn rand and uh you know white kid from the suburbs it was kind of what i needed to hear at the time as far as like you know get up get your act together also you know people are leeching off of you like there's a bunch of bullshit that comes with it but the fact that I was able to get out of that, I still like, I, I think it's very important to be able, like, you know, it's fun to dunk on somebody and you're just like, I eh, see the stupid shit he believes. But ultimately, like, you should be trying to make some kind of connection with this person because that's what will hopefully bring them out of it one day. Like one day this theory is going to fail them and they're going to feel that frustration. And they're not in that moment going to think of like, the guy who called him an asshole on Facebook, they're going to think of the guy who like put that little chink in the armor and said like, it's, you know, it's going to be okay when you come out of this talk, come talk to me then, you know? That's the most important thing to do with any uh, Q family member or Q friend that you have right now in your life is be, be there for them in a week. Like even just message them and say something like, look, after Biden gets sworn in, if you need to talk, just let me know. And they'll probably tell you to go to hell and there's no way Biden's going to get in and all this kind of stuff. But this is going to be a, uh, a cataclysmic event for them when Biden is officially made the president, because it's something that QAnon has said could not happen. It literally will not happen. And if you spent all your time just crushing that QAnon person in your life. And again, if you can't deal with them mentally, if they're too stressful, I understand it. That's fine. You do what you need to do for your own mental health. But if you just give them that option that they can reach out to you and you can help be the bridge back to sanity, 
that is an incredible thing to do because that's what they need. They need to be able to talk to somebody and just be like, man, I don't even get it. How is he supposed to, how is he the president? Trump was supposed to win. And that's when you can comfort them and like slowly pull them back from the precipice, slowly get them out of this thing. And again, like they have to do it themselves. Like I, you have to get out of it on your own. I had to get out of being a 9-11 truther and that kind of a schmuck myself. That takes like self-actualization. It takes work, mm-hmm. but having someone to help them, having someone to comfort them, having someone that there with them on that journey is so important. Um, like See, a- it's, it's, it's pure coincidence that it just happened to be named uh, QAnon because the the support group for families of alcoholics, again, addicts, is known as Al-Anon. And it feels like a lot of the same principles as Al-Anon apply, which is like, let this person know you love them. You're not going to enable them. Know that if they're ever going to get better, they need to want to get better. And it is not on you. Like, it's ridiculous the amount of parallels there are that I can't imagine were intended even a little bit. I was going to ask, when when people... So actually, tell us a little bit about the QAnon casualties, just like the history, how you guys got started and what happens there. So uh, originally what happened on Reddit was there was cult headquarters, which was the dunk on QAnon, make fun of QAnon uh, subreddit. And then someone decided to create a more uh, like socially conscious uh, forum called QAnon casualties for like family members and friends, people who've lost friends and family to QAnon and the conspiracy theory. And that was a small community. And one day the person running that small community was like, uh, I need some extra mods. If anyone wants to apply, they can. And I jumped at the chance because I wanted to try to help them out and Hmm. keep QAnon jerks out of that, uh, subreddit so they wouldn't be brigading it and harassing people trying to cope with losing a loved one to this nonsense so i was one of the early mods and then uh the next how, how, know, real quick how long have you guys been been around uh probably since like maybe about a year okay. uh, sometime sometime i mean it's just so hard trying to remember the world before covid as it were uh, yeah basically what happened was is we were small and then COVID hit and then we became incredibly big <laughs> because all these people started like just being trapped in their houses, doing the stuff, on, doing research online. And they started like red pilling themselves and finding the bad places to go to find out the wrong reasons why COVID exists. COVID is 5G. COVID is a Chicon bioweapon. Mm. COVID is actually a uh, cover story for the arrest of Tom Hanks and all the other bad people. I remember that early on. That That is one of the, just the unfortunate happenstance with this, that you got to wonder if QAnon would have become as big as it did, if not for the fact that we did have like a once in a generation freak occurrence happen, like at the same time it was in its ascendance, you know? Yeah, well, once in a hundred years. I mean, this is this is like no, no one alive remembers of something like this happening. The Spanish flu mm-hmm. was like in the 1917. I mean, this is such a crazy event to happen. And it happened in the middle of this presidential election where Trump was going to lean into QAnon hard to try to win re-election. And you just had all, it was a perfect storm of events that led to this moment, which grew the QAnon casualties subreddit so much. And then... Now we have like nine moderators or whatever. We, we now have like over 70,000 people on the forum, which is both like good that there's a support group and terrifying that it has to be that large. Yeah. And it was at this point that uh, we started getting a lot of uh, requests for press and media. And I became like the public relations arm of QAnon casualties. Like, um, cause I was, cause a lot of these people, like some of them do know QAnon, one of our mods is actually a guy who got out of QAnon and is now working to kind of atone for it. Okay. I love that guy so much. But a bunch of these people like don't have that much knowledge about the actual like conspiracy theory they're fighting, and they know that I do. So they're like, "Yay, poker! Go go get them! Go go out there and like talk about our community and talk about QAnon and like just get out the good work." I'm like, "You got it, guys." So. But that's uh, it, it, it's it's always important to have the convert in any kind of outreach situation like that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and uh, just so we've just kept expanding that way, and 
now there's also like a, another subreddit called recovery with a Q instead of a C in the word recovery. Mm. And that is for ex QAnon members, people who've actually left QAnon and defined each other. And that move, and again, much as like QAnon casualty was a small when it started, recovery is pretty small right now, but it could get a lot bigger after the 20th. I mean, that could be this yeah. really pivotal moment. So, uh, All right. well, two big, two big questions for you then. One, are there any, uh, what, can you think of like a big standout? I mean, frankly, I've read QAnon casualties a bit and they're all like, horribly destructive but can you think of anything that like really stood out of like okay that's even in this bad situation that's a bad one uh the after the election uh someone on QAnon casualties uh posted that their aunt killed themselves because they couldn't oh, live in God. a world where Damn biden it. was president because the antichrist was going to rise up and destroy us all and I reached out to them and I was just like, can you confirm your story or anything like that? Because this is a pretty like bold thing to be saying on the internet where yeah. people do make up stuff. And they replied to me and they were like, look, uh, here's the information I, I'm willing to give you. The family does want to keep this kind of quiet, blah, blah, blah. And they seemed sincere. So again, grain of salt on the internet and all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. like that was just so crushing and bleak. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's, it's so crushing and bleak, but it's not... It's not far fetched. I mean, if you genu if you genuinely believe this, I fr I frankly, I'm astonished it doesn't happen more often. There was a, a reporter who uh, interviewed a QAnon supporter uh, before the election, and they asked that woman, like, what would happen if Biden won? And the woman said, I would take my kids into the garage, turn the car on, and that'd be it. Mm. And the reporter actually like went back to them to make sure they said that before they published it. And they're like, yeah, mm. I said that. That's what I said. Yeah, and just, every single time you hear about one of those like postpartum, and again, this is where we talk about the co-opting and how this shit spreads. Like every time you hear about one of those uh, postpartum depression murders, like every time like a, a woman like, you know, rolls her kids in a jeep into a lake or uh drowns them in a bathtub it's never caused like the depression isn't like ah fuck these kids it's always like this is a horrible world and this is a mercy killing i am saving my children from this wretched world so ugh. yeah i mean that, that's the thing is like literally you are seeing the devil beat god in this situation this is the narrative that's been constructed for you and I remember like the usually Q and on usually Q when he would post would um, be incredibly uh, arrogant and cocky and talking about how like we're going to win and we're going to crush them and we're all good. But then like during the election, there was like this period of time where Q was suddenly like, hey, they're throwing the kitchen sink at us and we got to be ready for it because this thing is... Uh, this is serious and this is real serious business. Uh, yeah, this is um, Q drop 4310 at, at the bottom of it. He says, uh, all assets deploy, win by any means necessary. Everything is at stake. Welcome to the shadow presidency of Barack H. Obama, Q. So, I mean, like, like that was the kind of message that he was sending like, in, the, in May, in the middle of the, of the, uh, the presidential campaign was that like, like they're throwing the kitchen sink at us. The world hangs on the edge of a knife. Like this is the battle we're engaged in. And it, it, it's like, and now if you're believing this stuff, you have to believe they lost. And again, the QAnon promoters are like just lying and pushing the ball back, pushing the goalposts as far back as they can. And they're talking about how like literally Biden's either gonna just about take the oath or like get halfway through the oath and then SEAL Team 6 is going to run up there and grab him and cuff him and save us all from him. And it's just like, well, when Biden actually completes the oath and then goes to the podium and starts talking about healing our nation, like, what are these people going to do then? Like, what's the, because there's no more goalposts moving at that point. Now the impossible has happened. And how do you move on? Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of hucksters out there wondering how the hell they're you know, they're they're trying to sell their Q merchandise before the twentieth. I'll tell you that much. Um, oh, absolutely. I mean, so go ahead. Uh, no, 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 sorry. I was gonna move on to something. Say what you're gonna say. No, uh, yeah, it's just I, I've seen attempts at goalposts moving already. I've seen people saying stuff like maybe this won't be ended by the inauguration. Maybe something. 
Mm. And what these people I don't seem to they don't seem to get the idea that once uh, you're an ex president, like you stop becoming really important. You're not on television all the time. I know Trump might try to keep his brand going. He might try to keep himself on TV, but the president is like a twenty four seven thing, where you're the guy and you're what everyone's talking about. And when you're no longer that guy, you no longer have that cachet. I, I really pray to God the media just doesn't cover him all that much. I mean, he doesn't have his Twitter now, so there's that. Let, let me ask you that. Why do you think Trump became this unofficial figurehead of this? Is it do, like the, all I have in my thing is like he lives in the same state of fear and paranoia. Even, I mean, he's obviously drummed that up populism wise. Like, why, why are things bad in the country? It's not due to the people with all the power. It's those immigrants that that's who did it. And also, this guy has just never met a rube he couldn't fleece. And as soon as they worked against his desires, he threw him under the bus just like he does with everybody else. Uh, I think it's it was it's one part of the fact that he is kind of a conspiracy theorist himself, and that made this. Uh, it made QAnon an easier fit for him, but it also just happened to be that he was the president at this moment because um, once the narrative started that Hillary was going to get arrested, then you have to ask the question, well, who's capable of arresting Hillary Clinton, the former secretary of state, first lady, first uh, major party nominee that was a woman for the presidency, all this kind of stuff. Like who has the gravitas and the cachet to grab this woman and put her behind bars. And Trump had always been chanting, lock her up and all this kind of stuff. So it made it really easy for Q to be like, yeah, Trump's gonna get her and Trump's gonna get all the other bad guys. This was, um, this is a cult of power. This was the president is on our side and he's going to strike down our enemies. Now, would this kind of cult of personality worked if we had had like President Ted Cruz or John Kasich or Marco Rubio? Probably not. Trump was a better vehicle for it. But I, 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 I may hate the man, but I would not deny that he has charisma, which I, I kind of hate. But on the other hand, it gives me hope that uh, hopefully this will kind of a lot of this stuff will peter out with him just because there's really no there's nobody else with that like personality coming up behind him. Oh, that, I mean, that's a, that's a really big thing for them is that, like, the Republicans don't exactly have a bench. I mean, Trump wiped the floor with all of these guys, mm -hmm. Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, all of these guys, Trump dunked on them. And Howley and Cotton and all these other milk toast schmucks, like, they don't have it. They don't have that uh, ability to uh, galvanize people the way Trump did and to mm -hmm. create this hyper loyal uh, movement in QAnon, where again, I mean, you have people believing he's gonna find a way to pull this off. That like, even though we're seven days away from him leaving office, they're sure he won't. They're sure that this master chess player has one more move in him that's gonna turn this whole thing around. And like when he's gone, I mean, Don Jr. can't do it. Uh, uh, obviously cursing myself by saying such a thing, but it's just, yeah, don't don't you put that knock on wood right now. Do not put that jinx on this goddamn yeah, planet. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I mean, it's just it just doesn't feel like they have like somebody else because uh, they had this very um, the cognitive dissonance of of these people is is legion. But they would uh, I was seeing like on Infowars because uh, I track Alex Jones as well. Um, mm -hmm they were talking about how the Democrats stole the Georgia elections from us. And then at the same time, the Republicans got like a hundred thousand less votes than Trump did in Georgia. So like a section of his base didn't turn out for that pivotal right. election. And it's like, that's, that's the real story. Like you can lie to your, you can lie to your people and tell them they got robbed and the election was stolen, but it's it, it, it's it's a hostage situation like you never intend to give the hostage taker what he wants you're just trying to like like yeah buddy it's all gonna be okay let's just land this thing you know yeah oh yeah they're they're, they're trying to placate these people but they still need their votes and now they're finding out that well we actually can't give you the election we can't have mike pence overrule the electoral college we don't have any evidence of voter fraud. 
But uh, yeah, still vote for us anyways, even though Trump's going to be out of power and irrelevant in two weeks. So come on, come on, guys, help us out a little. <laughs> yeah. And like, so that that is kind of like, in a way, reassuring that as ridiculous and dumb as Trump is, he might have been the best it's going to be for Republicans for like the next decade or so. God, God help us all. Okay. Um we're uh, we're at about an hour now. I have a few more questions, so I guess we'll uh, just try to run through that real quick. Let, let's let's do on the hopeful side. Um, in your experience on you know the QAnon casualties, when people do come around, like when they do come out of the QAnon world, how and why do they do it? Like how how do you get people when they make the journey back? What's the journey like that you've seen? Uh, the journey back is generally, uh, it's just seeing that you are not being told the truth by QAnon and you actually start going to non-QAnon sources to find the information you need and you start like seeing the other side and you're willing to acknowledge the other side and you're willing to listen to your family. And that's one of the very much cult-like aspects of this movement is that they tell you the mainstream media is lying. They're telling you everyone's just absolutely conning you and that you can only trust their sources. You can only trust Q. You can only trust like right-wing media and the QAnon promoters and anyone else you listen to is bad. Mm. So when you get out of that echo chamber, when you get out of that bubble and you start going elsewhere, that's when you can find your way out. Uh, I had this very kind of hilarious, it was terrifying, but in the end it turned out to be a hilarious thing where most uh, hilarious things are terrifying at the start one of my friends who knows me as the QAnon guy and i've known her for years she messaged me about the wayfair thing and about wayfair transporting kids and all Mm. this stuff and i kind of chuckled and then i gave her a couple things to show her it wasn't true and then she started fighting back on me and pointing out more evidence for it And I was just like, oh my God, like this person knows that I'm on the level. They know who I am and they know what I do. And they know that I deal with this stuff all the time. And my word still isn't good enough for her. And we have a group text on my phone and me, a friend of hers and her, we literally had to like hash it out for like three hours before she finally acknowledged that like she was like losing her mind and that like this was dumb. Mm-hmm. And we, we and how we tease her about it all the time. We call her Wayfair Lady and stuff like that. <laughs> but it's like, it was just, it was it, in that moment, it was horrifying because I was watching someone go down the rabbit hole in mm-hmm. real time. And I'm like grabbing at their arm, going, No, no, do not go down the rabbit hole. Come back to reality. And thankfully, we were able to keep her out. And it's just, that's why the most important thing is, is like getting someone out is an incredible feeling. And it is incredibly rewarding when you get your friend back. But mm-hmm. I, 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 I have to wonder if there isn't maybe some prevention in that. Like if your mostly level-headed friend starts coming to you with this stuff, maybe maybe your official first response shouldn't be like, that's stupid. Maybe it should be like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Hey, how are things at home? You okay? Yeah, uh, prevention and forewarning is so important. Mm. Like telling people what QAnon actually is. Because just QAnon throws out all these hooks that appear benevolent and like, the universally good, like save the children, drain the swamp, fight corruption. Oh yeah, no, they absolutely jumped on that save the children thing because who who could be against saving children? And then you find out that a lot of what they're doing is really like gumming up the works of legitimate like child advocacy groups because they're calling in, you know, they're the fucking local plumber who they don't like. So obviously he's a child eater. Right, exactly. I mean- And that's the thing is that you have to let people know that like save the children isn't benevolent, that like drain the swamp doesn't mean you're fighting corruption, that these are just like the front. This is just like the way to lure you in. I remember uh, the QAnon Anonymous podcast, they went to like a save the children rally and within like 45 minutes, a guy with a bullhorn is like screaming about Bill Gates uh, killing them with a vaccine and they're all screaming that they won't take the vaccine. And it's like, this doesn't have anything to do with saving children. Come on, guys. Yeah, I mean, you got to look at the, the fucking, uh, the, the Jim Jones cult started out as like a really progressive, like all ethnicities church. And then it just kind of spun out into being a cult. Like it, this, this shit yep. happens. Yep, absolutely. 
Um, who all right, in your opinion, who do you think Q actually is? Um, the writer doesn't matter. What matters is the people who control the message boards and control the editing, and that's Jim Watkins and Ron Watkins. Mm -hmm. um, they have access to the trip codes, which are like the way you identify yourself on 8kun. So like when you look at a Q drop, it'll have this like alphanumeric gibberish at the top of it. Um, like right now, or I should say like back when Q was still posting, he hasn't posted since uh, December 8th. It's been over a month since Q's shown up. Mm. But like all the Q drops now would have like exclamation point, exclamation point, upper case, uh, uppercase H, lowercase S, and then so on and so forth. Just a bunch of gibberish. And that was the way you would identify Q as being Q. And like that trip code, they have control over it. They could put anyone behind that trip code if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. And if Q like made a Q drop that like said something they didn't like, they wouldn't let it go up on 8kun. So they have complete control over this thing. So is it one of them writing it? Is it like one of Jim or Ron's friends writing it? Is mm -hmm. it just a random troll who they've gotten in touch with to write it? It doesn't really matter because they they own the keys to the kingdom. They have yeah. all the control over this thing. Yeah, that came so, up on uh, something I read, which was uh, after several Q-related mass shootings, 8chan was taken off the internet. And during that time, Q did not communicate any, you would think, you know, this high-level security guy, he would go somewhere else. But no, just happened to wait until the website came back up. So at the very least, he is extremely tied to the people who run this site enough so that he wasn't going to do anything like his, his message wasn't so important that he needed to get it to people elsewhere. It's now nah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the baby eaters, but only on my friend's site. Like that's important. Uh, yes. That is one of the things that happened is after Q moved from 4chan to 8chan, he made a post where he said no outside comms. He made it clear that only on 8chan would he ever post anything. And if anyone tried to claim they had access to him on any other social media platform, that they were lying. So uh, it made Q and QAnon proprietary to 8chan and now 8kun. It's so, so bald faced. Like, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, you know, I, I have uh, to wrap it up. I have two actually kind of fun questions in the midst of all this. The first one isn't even a question. I was doing research on something and then I saw that you had already beaten me to the punch by a lot on Twitter. The wrong predictions. Oh my God. Uh, I'm curious what favorites you have in there. I remember, obviously, we have the rumors that uh, the Pope or Hillary Clinton or Obama or Tom Hanks were all going to be arrested. I remember it even got big enough that the week that Tom Hanks was supposedly arrested, he just happened to show up on SNL. And then they were doing a lot of bending over backwards, like uh, he's doing it from his prison cell. Somebody broke in with a camera and a very strong satellite signal. And they're putting a hologram of him up in Studio 8H in New York City for Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they find all kinds of excuses for everything. Uh, every um, bulge in someone's uh, pant leg is an ankle monitor proving that they've secretly been arrested. Uh, when that ankle monitor goes away, they've obviously cut some sort of deal elsewhere. Um, I think that like my favorite kind of uh, QAnon meltdown things is that when Q went to Aid Kun, uh, whatever quality control existed, in his Q drops uh, fell off the side of a cliff because <laughs> he was just getting so many things that were like just obvious, just like totally wrong. Uh, he got really angry about um, someone had a mail-in ballot from California and this was like pre-COVID. Mm. Um, it was like 2000. Yeah. It was, yeah. So it was, it was, it was um, the presidential election in uh, California primary and Basically, the ballot they had was they could vote for a Democrat or they could vote for like green or something like that. But then like if you looked at the back of it, it said you had to register as a Republican to get a Republican ballot. And Q was like screaming that this was voter suppression. This was trying to keep the Republicans from being able to vote in California. And the reason why this person got the ballot the way they did is because they were an independent. And in California, the primary for president was open. And the primary for president and the Republican Party was closed. Mm -hmm. You have to register a Republican to get a Republican ballot. So this wasn't the fix was in the screw over the Republicans. 
this was how the Republicans were actually running their primary. Right. They couldn't figure that out. <laughs> and then um, the other one that was really hilarious was he posted links to uh, the human, uh, the human farm. I, I forget exactly the name of it, but it's like the human harvesting farm or something like that. It was like this edgelord vegan humor Facebook page where they like show like babies with barcodes on their foreheads. Ow. And they're getting ready to cook them and grill them and eat them. Right. Making a and, point, making a point about veal yeah, trying to be a, satirical. Right. Exactly. It's, it's, it, it's vegans trying to explain that meat is murder. And that if you view humans as meat, maybe you'll get the clue that meat is bad. And then the other thing that he linked to was uh, the cannibal club, which is this again, satirical website that's been around for like, like 10, 10 15 years. I'm stunned it wasn't like hosted on geosites when I clicked on it. <laughs> and the staff at the supposed cannibal club are all stock photos. Uh, the, 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 it doesn't list a real address. There's nothing to it. It's just a joke about uh, basically Hollywood elites enjoying the decadence of human flesh and all this kind of stuff. And again, Q was just like acting like this was real. And then when people brought it to his attention that it was fake, she was like, well, they start by calling it satire. And then that's how they get you, waka waka. Which again, I find hilarious because that's something they accuse the left of all the time. All the time of like, oh, they know it's a joke, but they're making a big old stink about it. It's the, I'm tired. As, as somebody who does comedy, stop hiding behind fucking jokes because none of you are fucking funny. You don't know what is or isn't. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and then uh, the, the the one then the other dumbest one that I'll finish with here was uh, he retweeted something that was like supposed to be MSNBC, like uh, accidentally or misleadingly posting World War Z as B-roll footage in the background mm -hmm. of like I forget if it was COVID or some other like uh, uh, BLM protest or whatever, and. The thing was, is if you looked at the actual Krylon and stuff on the photo, it was like literally in the photo. It was like, this is a parody. This didn't really happen. MSNBC did not post this. This is a joke. And when people called out Q for it, he replied and was like, hey, guys, thanks for catching that mistake. Uh, it's I don't have great visibility in this helicopter. Catch you later. And people were like, what, what are you talking about? What does being in a helicopter have to do with watching the news? Like, this is so dumb. Yeah, sorry. I was really busy. We were taking down a factory that was cloning Osama bin Laden's and uh, my finger slipped. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, God. If he, if he had said that, it would have been more plausible. Oh, my Lord. Oh, God. When we talk about the wrong predictions, again, having lived through eight years of the Obama administration, uh, giving family members shit, I'll always give them that little like, oh, yeah, QAnon, Trump, etc. Like, hey, uh, is Obama going to get around to declaring martial law and taking all the guns then? Like, you guys said that was on his schedule. Did he just never get around to it or uh, uh, just the fact that they take no stake of how many times they are just fucking wrong it just it doesn't factor oh they yeah they i mean they, they said that like obama was gonna not concede the presidency that he was gonna install himself as a dictator and refuse to let trump in i mean they always again our, our enemies are gonna do the horrible thing that our guy would never do and then look what fucking happens <laughs> oh i mean oh there's uh i mean there are people now uh, like re uh, restating the dumb joke that uh, I think it was Postebeck, but I know it was Huckabee, but there were like two clowns who said stuff like, oh, if you impeach a president in his first term, it invalidates that term and gives him a chance for a third term, idiot Dems. Oh, and there were so many people that were celebrating that idea. And then eventually those two schmucks had to be like, look, guys, I was just joking. Again, what you just said before, just jokes, guys, just yep. jokes. I, uh, I I have a friend of mine who is very, very politically active. And he actually said to me with a straight face, the other day, and he's like extreme leftist, but this is just shows how people just get these ideas in their head. He told me that there is some line somewhere hidden in the Constitution, and he's worried that Trump might invoke this, where apparently it, uh, the, the, the president can be declared a king. And I just had to... I'll make up his name. And I just had to stop him. Like, Barry, Barry, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, I have written blogs longer than the U.S. Constitution. There's nowhere for it to hide. It's not like a fucking, you know, 
gigantic book somewhere. It's like 20 pages. Somebody would have found it at some fucking point and made a note of it. It's like, I'm just saying, you know, like, mm. Oh yeah, like that. Like that kind of reminds me of uh, the nonsense they had about like that. Kind of sounds like the whole thing about what Pence was going to be allowed to do, where these guys were like saying that Pence was allowed to do whatever he wanted with electors, mm -hmm. and um, their excuse, their justification for this was that in 1961, uh, Richard Nixon, uh, Hawaii. On the night of the election, it looked like Nixon had won Hawaii and he had electors certified on his behalf for winning Hawaii. But after a long recount, it turned out JFK had won Hawaii. And so when the Electoral College met to certify JFK winning, uh, at one point, Nixon was just like, hey, if no one, if everyone, if everyone's cool with it, I'm going to give Hawaii to Kennedy. Is that OK? And everyone, and he, made, he said, if there's no objections, I'll do this. And then no one objected to it because it didn't matter. Everyone knew Kennedy won Hawaii. It didn't decide the Electoral College. It didn't matter. So oh, because, because Nixon was the vice president when he was running for that presidency, correct? Right, exactly. Gotcha. So as, okay. as vice president chairing the meeting for the Electoral College, Nixon did this thing where he was being a bro and he gave Kennedy a state he won, even though technically like he could have kept it for himself because he did have electors on the slate for himself. Mm -hmm. And all these guys started coming up with this idea that, look, Nixon showed you could he could unilaterally do whatever he wanted because he he swept away his own delegates and took, took Kennedy's. And again, if you read the actual transcript of that meeting in Congress, Nixon asks if there's objections before he does it. And no yeah. one says anything because counting electoral votes is fucking boring. And they all just want to go out and leave. They just want to get out of there. See, uh, that's uh, that is such the horrible thing. And it shows what a bad time we're living in. The fact that they're not only are they wrong, like, oh, no, you're wrong in that as bad as Nixon was, he still had respect and honor for the dignity of the fucking office. But you're going to misinterpret that to still fit your bullshit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's ridiculous. Like, I remember uh, I, I posted a tweet about that and I said Nixon was just being a bro. And someone replied to me and they were like, I can't imagine Nixon being a bro. And I'm just like. Oh god! Like, har no harm, no foul. Hey, Jackie boy. Um, all right, dude. Thank you for doing this. I have one last question. Don't think I'm trying to trap you here. I just thought it would be funny. So, no problem. No problem. having been a 9/11 truther and having been, uh, you know, fighting against this whole QAnon thing, are there any conspiracy theories that you do kind of somewhere in the back of your head, like? Eh, that one maybe like do you have any that you still at least entertain a little bit uh entertaining them yeah it's like it's tough to say exactly i mean i'll like believe I'll, like all kinds of like silly things like i remember um when the uh when the dodgers won the world series this year and justin turner like in the middle of the game got pulled and then it came out like in like the seventh inning that he had COVID and stuff like that. And then the Dodgers won. I, I forget if they come back to win or if they just held on to win. But I remember like people were saying that like Major League Baseball, because it was game six, and Major League Baseball like made the call to tell the Tampa Bay Rays to throw the game <laughs> because if Turner had COVID and he'd been in the dugout all game and the Rays won game six, they would have to play game seven like two weeks later or something because the Dodgers would have to quarantine. They'd have to lock themselves up. So baseball was like, hey, hey, Tampa, just lay down. We'll slip you some money, but but, but you can't win this game because it would ruin everything if you win game six because we can't play game seven if you do. So like that kind of stuff makes me laugh and I think about that sometimes. Okay, that's a fair one. Like, uh, funny, what the two that come to mind for me one might be too obscure out there for wrestling fans. There was a whole like real life double cross of a wrestler known as the Montreal screw job. I personally think that was all fixed more so than regular wrestling. But I would honestly say the year that uh, hurricane Katrina happened and then the new Orleans saints won the super bowl. For me, that was like this. I don't have any evidence. I didn't hear anything. Nobody called me. I didn't have a, a walk into the wrong bar in Mardi Gras, but something about that, like, that's just a little bit too on the nose, if you ask me. <laughs> oh, I, I hear that kind of stuff all the time. I remember um, the, 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 uh, the marathon bombing happened in Boston. And then that year, um, 
we the Bruins played the Blackhawks in the Stanley Cup Finals, mm. and when the Bruins were up two one, I remember Blackhawks fans screaming, "This shit is rigged because of the bombing. They're giving the cup to the Bruins. This sucks." And then the Blackhawks won the next three games. So it was like, damn it. I wish it had been rigged for us. I would have liked to have won another Stanley Cup. Listen, and, uh, the same as, a, thing with, yeah, as, as a Flyers fan, I do not have any pity for the Bruins. Unfortunately, they oh. have they pretty much always been a consistently great team. Like, this shit's just going to happen sometimes. Oh, of course. And uh, there was like that conspiracy theory also happened with the Golden Knights. They're like their inaugural season mm. to make the Cup Finals. And that was after the Vegas shooting. And people were like, oh, they're giving it to them feel good story and then they got smashed by the capitals so i mean like <laughs> like it, I, that kind of stuff just it, it's out there and i hear it all the time and it, it makes me laugh there's like like i'm working on a QAnon book now but like after like that is done and that kind of stuff is out of my head i'm seriously thinking of making a book called this shit is rigged where i just go through all these oh, that- conspiracy theories and talk about them i implore you to please make that book because that <laughs> That would be so good. All right, Mike, I can't think of a better way to end than right there. Uh, again, remind us where we can find you on social media. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Poker Politics. And again, the podcast is Adventures in Hell, in Hell World with a Q instead of an O in World. And you can find that on my on, you can find that on my Twitter and also on Spotify, iTunes, and all those other good places. All right. And on in addition to that, uh, if you have anybody out there dealing with uh, – QAnon and their family, point them to reddit.com slash r slash QAnon casualties. Cause Mike, I think you and the guys there are really doing the Lord's work. And uh, I, I, for one appreciate you. So thank you for that. Thank you so much. All right. I'm going to end this. Like I end every episode, I'm going to stop recording, but you and I can still talk for a second later folks. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yo, emergency show back on. Uh, I just told Mike that we were previously the I Hate Infinite Jazz podcast. And Mike, could you please repeat yourself what you said? I said I got through two chapters of Infinite Jest and just gave up because it was just so self-important and self-indulgent. I just, I just couldn't deal with it. I just couldn't deal with it. Uh, when I actually read that as like the, the line of the, uh, the URL for this uh, podcast, I was like, that is hilarious because... <laughs> I'm also one of these people who doesn't like infinite jest. So I'm really glad that I'm going on a podcast with someone who agrees with me about that terrible book. Mike, I did the same thing as you, but I had so many people who liked the book that I, I knew I literally started this podcast as a COVID project of like, okay, you, you keep saying this book is great. I'm going to force my way through it. I'm going to call you on your shit the entire time. And every week I would just have people on who loved this book and tear into them. Like what is so good about this? Oh, I'm, I, I'm glad I finished it. I still don't think it's a great book, but that is just too goddamn funny that you also had the same opinion. Yeah, <laughs> I'm glad I, I'm glad I could validate you, sir. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, this could be the end of the podcast and the end of the conversation, because frankly, you've been you've given me more than enough of your time. And this was a great episode. And thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. All right, man. Take it easy. Thank you very much. Yep. See you later.